Welcome to Zoe Science and Nutrition, where world-leading scientists explain how their research can improve your health. Intermittent fasting. It seems like every day someone new is talking about it. But what is it exactly? There seem to be so many options. From the 5-2 diet, suggesting two days each week of extreme calorie restriction, to the warrior diet, which involves eating only raw fruit during the day before a mammoth feast at night. Whatever the approach, it involves restricting the window of time when you're allowed to eat. Supporters of intermittent fasting are evangelical about the benefits, promising weight loss, disease prevention, even life extension. Currently, the scientific evidence is unclear, but it's an exciting area that may be full of potential. Today's guests certainly think so. Jin Stevens has her own powerful experience of how intermittent fasting transformed her health and her weight. She has written two books on the subject, Fast, Feast, Repeat, and Cleanish, and supports a global community of fasters. She's here to tell us her story. We're also joined by Tim Spector, one of the world's top 100 most cited scientists and my scientific co-founder at Zoe. Tim will share what the science can tell us about intermittent fasting today, and interestingly, how much it can't tell us yet. He has an exciting announcement about how this is set to change. Jin Stevens and Tim Spector. Thank you for joining me today. And Jin, thank you for joining us despite being in the middle of a hurricane. So yes, are we, you, are, we are, are in you? a category one, Hurricane Ian. Thank goodness it's not going to hit us like it hit Florida because I'm on the South Carolina coast, but it's still very windy and lots of rain. Uh, but you're okay. I'm fine. Yeah, I'm on the third floor. So whatever happens, I should be okay. All right. Well, you know, this is a first for for the Zoe podcast. And uh, Tim and I sit in London are thinking, well, you know, maybe it rains a little bit today, but we're definitely not used to hurricanes. So uh, we're very impressed that you joined us. Well, thank um, you. And I'm not used to them either. We just have moved to the coast in May. So this is our first time. So, But it helps me understand why people have hurricane parties, because it's it's definitely nerve wracking, even as a category one. Well, you're making us a bit nervous just uh, just hearing, hearing about it and, and seeing you here. So let's start before the hurricane cuts off the electricity with our quick fire round of questions from our listeners. Uh, and Jin, I have uh, three questions for you to start with. Okay. So the first is, in your experience, can intermittent fasting have a big impact on people's health and weight? Yes. It is literally the most powerful thing I've ever done for my weight and my health. All right. Will I feel weak and hungry if I start intermittent fasting? Well, the answer is yes and then no. We'll talk a little bit more about that, I am sure. And then thirdly, in your experience, does intermittent fasting lead to weight loss for everybody? Well, weight loss is multifactorial. I love that word because it, it, our bodies are complicated. So intermittent fasting is a great health strategy, but you might do, need to do some tweaking. For example, your gut health, what you're eating other things, hormones, all of those play a role. Intermittent fasting has a lot of powerful things that it does in the body, but it doesn't fix every single problem you might be having. But you can tweak it till it's easy and find your magical weight loss solution. Well, I don't want to use the word magical, but you can find your weight loss solution. And I told Jen she was allowed one sentence. I didn't realize Sorry. she was really good at long sentences. So I'll, <laughs> I'll tighten this up from next episode. Tim, are the health benefits of intermittent fasting proven? Yes, although we don't know what goes on long term. So definitely short term. Are there risks from intermittent fasting? There are some risks, but minimal if you're fairly healthy and it doesn't last very long. And finally, we had a lot of questions about whether intermittent fasting affects men and women differently, particularly due to female hormones and menopause. We simply don't know. We don't really have enough data at the moment to answer that question. That's why we need bigger studies. And I think that's actually a perfect way to introduce uh, some very exciting news, right, Tim? So uh, Zoe is actually about to launch the world's biggest ever intermittent fasting study. Um, and part of that is because we don't know most of the answers, right, to these scientific questions. Tim, can you tell us what's going to happen? Yeah, up to now, most of these studies have been done with about 50 people followed for a few months in very tight conditions. And no one's really looked at thousands or hundreds of thousands of people in a real life scenarios in their real 
environments, day jobs, you know, looking after kids, going to work, etc. So what uh, we're doing with Zoe is getting this massive, massive community, these citizen scientists who are already signed up for the Zoe Health study and others might want to join to participate in this mass intervention where for uh, several weeks we ask people to shift the time they're eating, uh, not to uh, necessarily calorie restrict, but just eat their meals at different times so they are within a, a smaller time window. And we're looking at, uh, you know, 10 hours is around where we're aiming at. And we want this to be done uh, as well as people can do it. And then just look at the real life results and see how many people feel better, uh, like Jid. How many fee- people feel energized? How does it change their lives? And do some people find it really difficult and work out why that might be. So it's a real life study on a scale uh, a thousand times bigger than has been done before, but it's going to tell us enormous amounts about how this might work as, as, as public policy for, for all kinds of people, whether they're young, old, males, females, menopausal, on HRT, all these kind of questions we could answer. And it's super exciting. And uh, I can't wait to get started. Uh, and Tim, it does sound super exciting. I'm excited as well. How big a study are you hoping to to get here? I'd love to get uh, at least 50,000 people doing this. And uh, our estimates are that there are plenty of people out there really keen to to do this kind of study. And we're going to uh, you know, start in the, the UK and then uh, open up to the US and then hopefully the rest of the world if it all if it all takes off, because it'd be lovely to see how this works in different scenarios, in different food cultures, in different uh, you know, places where uh, people eat meals at different times, et cetera. So I think um, it's it's going to be you know one of the most exciting projects I've ever done in my career. Amazing. And if you want to participate, then uh, we're going to give you the, the website link right now, which is joinzoe.com slash fasting that's f-a-s-t-i-n-g uh, and you can go there and uh you can get the instructions for how to uh how to sign up um or if you're in one of the countries we're not yet supporting how to put your name down and hopefully join do that as we as we expand it so and just to say it doesn't cost anything so you know there's no sign up fee uh you don't have to buy any special meal kits or anything uh no special recipes all you got to do is really just say, I want to find out if this makes me feel better or worse and help science. And that's all you've got to do. Just keenness is all we're after. Absolutely. And I'm I'm particularly interested because uh, I think I should make this admission at the beginning, Jin. Uh, I'm a terrible snacker late into the <laughs> evening. So um, generally, my diet is pretty good, transformed over the last five years. But I have to say that dark chocolate on the sofa at about 10 p.m. is probably one of my key vices. So uh, I've always been too scared of being hungry to, oh. to commit to uh, intermittent fasting. So I think this conversation might be enough to give me the motivation to uh, to sign up and take part in this study and figure out uh, how it works. Well, definitely don't be scared. Intermittent fasting, you know, there's a saying, I don't know who created it, but um, you know, diets are easy in contemplation and hard in execution, whereas intermittent fasting is the opposite. It's hard in contemplation, but easy in execution. So I, I think you'll, you'll find it, it isn't anything to be afraid of. Wonderful. And look, Jin, why don't we just start actually today with your own personal experience? I thought that was a really interesting way to, to approach this whole um, uh, topic. So what is intermittent fasting and how has intermittent fasting impacted your life? Well, intermittent fasting is not a diet. And I want to get that right out there because your diet is what you eat. You know, everyone has a, a diet that they're eating, whether it's the standard American diet or the Mediterranean diet or whether you've gone through, you know, the Zoe protocol and now you're 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 eating according to the the scores that you get on Zoe, but everyone eats the way that they eat. Intermittent fasting is about when you eat. So, however you're eating right this minute, whatever that is, you can add intermittent fasting to it. The most common form of intermittent fasting that that most people end up as a long-term approach is one we call time-restricted eating. And and that's actually what your study is going to be. It's a time-restricted eating study with about a 10-hour eating window. Um, In the intermittent fasting world, 
you know, there are a lot of different ways you can choose to structure your eating window. You know, an eight hour eating window became really popular um, in the I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. There was a book that came out called The Eight Hour Diet. Um, there are other eating window links you might enjoy. I tend to be someone with around a four or five hour daily eating window. Now, someone might be listening and thinking, oh, my gosh, that sounds so terrible. <laughs> but it's actually, you know, I've over time, you know, I like to call it you tweak it till it's easy. And I found a rhythm that feels really good for me. Um, I don't eat until late afternoon every day. And I have great energy, great mental clarity all throughout the day. Then I open my eating window. Usually I have um, a really hearty snack. And then later I have just an amazing dinner. I eat the foods that make me feel great, that are delicious, that are satisfying. You know, I might have a little something sweet to close my window. So you see there's nothing wrong with having a little dark chocolate on the couch. Then you close your eating window. Um, And then, you know, I go to bed and I am able to sleep really well. Um, And then wake up the next day and do it again. And it's just such a great way to live because I'm not counting macros. I'm not counting calories. I don't feel restricted. And over time, I've naturally gravitated towards eating the foods that that work best for my body. It's very different than how I started. You know, I was eating the standard American diet and eventually my body let me know it's not how it felt best. So intermittent fasting has been the most powerful thing that I, I ever have done in my entire life. I struggled with my weight and even was obese in um, up to 2014. I weighed 210 pounds, which is a lot of weight on a five foot five woman. And you know, my waist circumference was huge. And thanks to intermittent fasting, I was able to lose over 80 pounds. And I've been keeping it off since 2015, which is truly the most remarkable part. And so aside from the weight loss, you know, my health has also been transformed. I'm 53. And I literally feel better at 53 than I did at 33. You know, thanks to the health benefits and the longevity benefits of intermittent fasting, I believe I'm going to age well, and I'm really looking forward to to all that's coming my way. Fantastic. It's a brilliant story, Jen. And I think a, a bunch of people listening will be saying, well, I'm still a bit confused about what intermittent fasting is. So you talked there about sort of this time-restricted eating, which I think is increasing what people talk about. But could you maybe just explain maybe some of the other things um, that people think about when they think about intermittent fasting and to what extent those are still, I guess, popularly done or whether this is really time-restricted eating and intermittent fasting are now sort of the same thing for most people? Well, intermittent fasting is a big umbrella word now. And and it's just the way that, that people, the terminology has become to be used. Now, some people are like, no, intermittent fasting is only if you're doing longer periods of fasting intermittently, right? But, you know, really intermittent fasting is any time that you are purposefully having periods of time where you're fasting and then periods of time where you're eating. It might look like alternate daily fasting where you have a day of fasting, a day of eating, and, and you alternate that. Or in the UK, 5-2 was really popular for a while. And those were two days of fasting each week. Actually, they were really more calorie-restricted days. Um, but two days of that and then five days of, quote, regular eating. But time-restricted eating tends to be the way that most people live intermittent fasting as a lifestyle because it's just such a um, – it's just a great rhythm to get in from day to day and you feel good while you're doing it. And, you know, your body knows what to expect. You know, you're flipping that metabolic switch to fat burning and getting into ketosis during your daily fast. And then you eat and your body's able to switch those fuel sources um, because it, it's learned how to do that after after you've adapted. But, there, you know, just think about it as you're either fasting or you're feasting. Your your window, your eating window is open or it's closed. And so, you know, when your eating window is closed, when you're fasting, you don't have any decisions to make. That's one of the best parts about it. You don't have to have all that willpower because you're like, well, my window is closed right now. So you don't have to, you know, walk into the break room at work and think, should I have that donut now? Should I have it? No, your window is closed. So you're like, oh, a donut. I might save that for my eating window later. But you don't have to have that struggle of, you know, should I eat that or should I not? Because your window is closed. So when you're fasting, you want to stick to black coffee, plain tea, plain water, plain sparkling water. And that those are perfectly satisfying during the fast. And then you open your window and you you have what feels good to you during that time. Did that help? Yeah, you're an amazing proponent for this. Oh, yeah. 
Tim, what does the what does the science say about intermittent fasting? Well, again, as Jin says, it's it's lots of different things, and I think they often get mixed up. So, some part of intermittent fasting is a way of overall getting less energy in, actually ingesting less calories because you're sort of tricking your your body into not wanting it. So the ultimate result, if you're trying to eat like Jin does in four hours a day, most people can't actually eat that many calories in four hours a day that someone who's eating over 18 hours could do. So there's a sort of, uh, you know, that's one part of the equation. It's like a way without calorie counting to uh, actually reduce calories. And to some extent, fools your body slightly more than just, you know, saying I'm going to ho- have low calorie foods. And so that that seems to be one way uh, that it that it works. Then, of course, you've got um, while you're in this fasting period, your body is using these other fuels. It is, uh, you know, using ketones if, if there's, you know, carbs aren't floating around. So it's processing things in a different way. And then, of course, you've got also the, the role of the gut microbes uh, that if you're in a, a, a proper fast where we're not talking about the 5 2 diets, where which I think largely failed because you were getting 500 calories a day and often messing up the fast period. So you were getting small amounts of calories and that was more focusing on the calorie. Whereas this new way of, of eating is uh, extending that non-eating window uh, over as some of these alternate day fasts do. Um, you are you know going uh, 24 hours without eating in some cases. Well, the work all started in uh, mice it, back in around 2003 when people started to look and, and, and see, well, the idea that calorie restricting uh, rodents uh, increased their longevity. And then uh, some groups started to say, well, why is that? Is, and and could, as well as calorie restriction, could you change the time of eating and get the similar results? And so they, they, they did that. And the, the whole field of not only reducing the calories, but also by tweaking when you gave the meals often had similar metabolic effects. So for the lo- for that first 10 years, virtually everything was in uh, mice. And it's only really the last um, five to, to eight years, I think, that we've got uh, a decent amount of human data. And, and, and these- Tim, just on the mice, just to make sure we got that, are you saying that if you change when you feed mice, they suddenly live much longer? That sounds pretty crazy it does sound a bit wacky but that that's what they found that the if you could by manipulating the eating windows of mice you could uh, improve their metabolic state and get them to live uh, shorter or longer depending on what you were doing what's interesting is some of those early animal studies with the rats were just designed to be calorie restriction studies they would feed the the rats or the mice their whole allotment of calories however in a short period of time, like they would feed them the whole, like, here's what you get. And they found that the, the rodents ate the entire allotment in four to six hours. So, you know, the, you know, as, as a researcher, it's hard to nail down the variables. They were attempting to just compare calorie restriction to, you know, the, the rats and the mice that were eating around the clock, their, their normal way. But it ended up being that they were time restricted because of the way they just ate all of them, all those calories at one time. So even those early calorie restriction studies were actually accidentally intermittent fasting as well. So this is like when I empty the fridge um, by lunchtime and I'm too lazy to do anything else. So I'm not going to eat any more food until nighttime. That's like my, my time restriction fasted. by the <laughs> fact that I've just run out of uh, a food or or right. indeed, when I'm up here in my study and I've run out of the nuts, and then it's like, well, I can't be bothered to get any more, so I stop. So you're saying it's sort of a byproduct of a right. uh, limited amount of food. Yeah, and, and the way also the fast metabolism of mice. They're not, they're not the same as humans. They, they will you know, eat fast and uh, metabolize it very quickly. So that was the other problem. Is it was one thing to show that this mechanism exists in rodents and could, you know, these metabolic benefits and could extend life. It was quite another thing to say, how much does that affect humans? I think that's why we, we're waiting for these these studies. And um, the, the early studies then went on and did um, calorie restriction in, uh, in, in humans, showing that was beneficial 
in terms of metabolic effects and uh, potential. And could you explain a bit how, like, are these short-term studies, long-term studies? What are the, j just help us tend to understand a little bit what you're saying beneficial because everyone's going to jump off and start calorie restricting if it's beneficial. What, what's well, they're the... generally over months rather than years. And so most, the variety of them, none of them are big studies. They're all fairly small because these are really hard studies to do to get people to stick to the program because humans you know, like to eat and they suddenly don't like being treated like uh, lab rats, really. Um, so this was a really tough thing for, the, for these people to, to how to incentivize someone to carry on this study just so someone else could write a paper about it and get famous. So it was a challenge. So most of them would be three months, six months, this, this kind of uh, time. Uh, really hard to get people to do much more than six months of this in a, in a trial under, under standard conditions. So, But in that, they showed that all the parameters, your blood sugar levels, your insulin levels, uh, your blood fat levels, uh, everything that was showing things were healthy were improving. And that was a key point there that, yes, it showed that short term, these do work. Now, it turned out to be really quite hard to get people to stay on these diets. And that was really the, the problem because... Uh, your body was screaming at you, you know, I want to eat now. I want to regain that weight. And that's where this whole idea started to come in about, well, if we start changing the times of eating and, and start having, you know, one day of feeding and one day of fasting, uh, is this perhaps, does this have the same benefits and it is more likely to be sustainable? And I think there have now been about 12 studies which have compared the two where they randomized um, adults to either this standard steady calorie restriction over time, or they did it with uh, some f uh, intermittent fasting regime. And those studies, when you they're all quite small, they do vary a little bit. But if you take the summary of them, they show that both of these methods do work in terms of improving the metabolic health of the individual and losing weight. And that's now pretty clear, although because the studies are all small, you know, we lack a lot of the details about men versus women, different ages. Some, you know, some only took obese people, some only took you know, younger, younger people. And we haven't got a full picture of, of who it works best in and who it doesn't work in. But overall, uh, the, the science is pretty clear that at least short term, um, you can, on, on these diets, you can uh, lose weight and uh, improve your metabolic status. And the losing weight was the one that wasn't quite as good in these studies when you compare it with the calorie restriction, but the metabolic health was. So I think that's, that's the important message. And is it fair to say, Tim, this is definitely in that category of new and emerging scientific evidence. So you're, you're sounding pretty positive about it, but this is not yet at the point where this is as fully proven as maybe some of the other things that you might talk about. It's all fairly new. So we've only recently moved from animal studies into humans. We've, the number of the, the size of the studies so far is actually really small. You know, 50 people is seen as a big study. And of course, this means that we can't generalize it to everybody. We don't know how everybody's going to do well. And as we've always talking on these podcasts, you know, everybody is different to some extent and everyone's circumstances are different. But I think what it's showing is it has enormous potential for everyone, even just by tweaking their meal times uh, just by 30 minutes. Uh, if they did that over 10 or 20 years, could have you know, dramatic effects. So I think it's really important we take it seriously. There don't seem to be much in the way of downsides and huge amounts of upsides. So yes, we're still accumulating evidence, but uh, it's something that I think everyone can uh, self-experiment with uh, themselves. Well, Tim, you know, giving up that that dark chocolate at 10 o'clock is a big sacrifice on my side. So you got to understand there is potentially <laughs> a lot of emotional downside. So I'm, I'm excited by the experiment, but I'm not yet sure that this is one I'm, I'm, well, I'm willing to Well, if you give up your cornflakes <laughs> in the morning, you can have all your chocolate in the evening. It, that's what I was yeah. going to say. You just shift your eating window, the direction where you like, here's where I really want to be able to eat. I really want to have that. Maybe you could have it at 9 p.m. instead of 10, but you just nudge it this way, nudge it that way. Boom, you're doing it. 
Jin, you know what? That's a, that's a brilliant transition. So we, we've talked a bit about what it is and and, and what the science is. Um, one of the things we really like to do on this podcast is always talk about actionable advice. And it was one of the reasons I was really excited to to have you join because you've helped so many people um, to actually understand how to do this in practice. Um, so would you maybe guide a listener who has never done this before, is thinking of doing it. Hopefully they are, you know, just about to sign up for our study, in fact, as part of this. And just tell us, like, what does it mean? So imagine you're you're telling me I've never done this before. What is this thing? Help help me to walk through how I can do it and and be most likely to be successful. Yep. You really have to come into it with realistic expectations. And you're not going to start doing intermittent fasting on day one and then lose a ton of weight quickly. It's not like that. This is this is something brand new that your body has to learn how to do. Um, you're becoming metabolically adapted, becoming fat adapted, learning how to tap into fat stores for fuel. Your body is probably not very good at that if you've been eating the traditional, you know, three meals a day plus snacks. You've been living, you know, as from meal to meal during the day. And instead, you've got to teach your body to flip that metabolic switch and do something different. So in my um, in my book, Fast, Feast, Repeat, I have a very important period of time called the 28-day fast start. And it's actually kind of a funny story. When I was, I was finishing it up and it was about to be, you know, they were thinking ahead to publication. My um, literary agent said, now we need to get everything together, you know, for the publicity. How much weight should we tell people they're going to lose during that first 28 days? And I said, zero pounds and they might even gain weight. And they were like, well, no, we can't really say that. I'm like, but that's the truth of it. You know, intermittent fasting is not a quick weight loss approach. And, you know, for those first 28 days, six weeks, whatever it takes for your body to adjust, you're just learning how to do something new and you're adapting to the clean fast. So you just want to fast clean, tweak it till it's easy, meaning you're working to try to find a pattern that feels good to you. For me, I've ended up with probably a four to six hour eating window most days. Um, You know, I fast clean, meaning I stick to plain coffee, black, no flavors, nothing added. And Chin, just to make sure that's 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 clear to me, because um, fasting, I think like I can't have anything. But are you saying I can have coffee? What am I allowed during this fasting period? Well, let, let's talk about of course, plain water. Yes, nothing added to it, no flavors. You know, plain sparkling water is also fine. But you know, people sometimes say, well, how come I can have black coffee and plain tea? Because those have flavors. Well, they do have flavors, but they have a bitter flavor profile. And a bitter flavor profile is not associated with a cephalic phase insulin response. So, you know, the black coffee is is actually stimulating autophagy. We have not used the word autophagy yet, but autophagy is our body's powerful cellular housekeeping. It's like recycling and upcycling where our bodies during the fast can go in and clear up old junky proteins and really clean up things. Also, it's great for our immune systems. They can really function best during the fasted state. Um, and black coffee is likely to stimulate those processes. It even you know helps with fat burning. And so black coffee is a great thing to add into your fast. Now, if you find that black coffee makes you hungrier, if, if you don't want to have the coffee, you're not required to have the coffee. You can just stick to water if you want. But Black coffee does tend to stimulate the things we want to have going on during the fast. And, and Tim, any, any thoughts on that? I remember we had a lot of debate when we were doing our big um, Zoe Predict studies about whether or not you can have teas and coffees during during fasted periods. Yeah, I mean, I mean, no one knows absolutely for sure because the tests haven't been done. So this we're just getting an sort of expert consensus on this, really. But most people do believe. Uh, in the fasting world that yes uh black teas green teas uh coffees uh water are are perfectly fine where people start to disagree is can i have just a drop of you know a macchiato in my in my coffee just that tiniest little drop and and some people say you know if it's if it's less than uh equivalent of i don't know 10 or 20 calories it's probably okay your body probably won't be able to sense that as a meal and therefore break its fast. Other people, I think like Jin, would probably say uh, that avoid that. That could be you know, counterproductive and you actually lose all your benefits. Uh, I don't think we quite know yet. Uh, it may be that Jin's actually tried it herself and uh, seen any difference. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I have a whole section in Fast Feast Repeat where I talk about the clean fast. And there is at the end of, of that, the, there are two chapters about the clean fast. And there's a section where I have, you know, anecdotal stories from from intermittent fasters. And, you know, I've been in the intermittent fasting community since well before I ever wrote any books at all or had podcasts, um, really in, you know, 2014, 2015, started with the the support groups on Facebook. And anecdotally, it the difference between fasting clean and, you know, putting a little bit of this, a little bit of that, the bulletproof coffee, a little bit of butter, you know, all the things that people might be, you know, putting in there. The difference is night and day. And you have to really experience it for yourself. So anybody who's putting in a little sweetener or a little drop of cream or whatever, and you're like, it's fine. It works for me. I'm still losing weight. I feel okay. I would challenge you to try it with the clean fast. Give yourself 30 days. I call it the clean fast challenge. Go to Plain black coffee, plain tea, plain water, nothing flavored, nothing sweetener, nothing sweetened, nothing to lighten up your coffee. I've never had anybody try it for 30 days and then go back to the other way. So, you know, it really you just take that challenge and try it for yourself and see. Most people report that they can't believe the difference that it makes. So this is another example where what you're saying is, you know, anecdotally seeing this in practice, yeah. this is a model that works. You know, whatever the mechanism is, you know, whatever's going on behind the scenes, you know, I can give you the theory as to what I think why it's easier without all that, you know, based on what what we do know here are the theories. But in practice, you'll just see you're not white knuckling it. You're not hangry. All of a sudden you're like, oh, I really can fast till three o'clock and I feel great. Whereas before, when you were having that little bit of almond milk or a little bit of cream or the butter or the MCT oil or whatever, the, you know, that you saw a YouTube video that said it was okay, you leave that out and you're like, wow, the whole experience is different. This is all back to, this is just very new and not very well studied. So, so Jin, just to play back to like somebody listening, trying to do this. So I need to go to a clean fast when I'm fasting, I need to only have like this water and tea and coffee. Do I immediately go to like some constrained period on day one and stick with it? Help me to understand what else I do in this 28 days. That's a great question. And we have in, in Fast Feast Repeat, in the 28-Day Fast Start chapter, there are three different plans you can kind of choose from that are helping you adapt. You know, you might need to be someone who really eases in and starts slow. You know, I'm not suggesting anyone start with what I'm doing <laughs> as, as like day one. You know, you've really got to build up to it. I like to compare it to couch to 5K. You know, if someone wants to go run a 5K, you don't get off the couch on day one and run a 5K. You have to build up to it. And so fasting is the same way. We're very much building up our fasting, quote, muscle, right? It's not technically a muscle, but you know what I mean with that analogy. So you're building up to it. And that's what the, you know, the 28 days is really for. You know, you're, you're learning how to fast clean. There are going to be days where you feel hangry and you have to open your window earlier than you expected. And that's not a fail. That's just part of the process. We're learning to listen to our bodies. You know, we never want to feel shaky, like you're having a blood sugar crash. If you're ever shaky or nauseous, go ahead and eat. You know, forget about what the plan said to do that day. Go ahead and eat. And, you know, gradually as your body gets adapted, you'll find, you know, what feels good to you. Some people always feel better with a midday eating window. For example, they like to you know, skip breakfast, eat lunch, have a little maybe early kind of dinner, close their window, no couch snacking on chocolate for them because their window is closed, but they just, they sleep better when they have that middle of the day eating window. I'm not one of those people. I actually sleep better when my window is closer to bedtime. I've tried it all different ways. I wait till afternoon, open my window, eat till I'm satisfied, close my window. But only through experimentation have I learned that. You're not going to learn that in the first 28 days. It's very much a process. And your goal is to think of intermittent fasting as a lifestyle. You know, I interviewed a longevity expert um, for intermittent fasting stories, um, Dr. Gil Blander. He um, has a company now that does some things with biomarkers, but he, he has studied um, longevity in general. And he said to me, this was a couple of years ago, but he said he believes that one of the most powerful things we can do to increase longevity is intermittent fasting. You know, just have that piece in there. Understand, you know, why we're doing it. I don't want anybody to start intermittent fasting only because you might lose some weight. 
that's that's not what intermittent fasting really is is all about. You know, of course, I came to it for the weight loss. I like to say, you know, we come for the weight loss, but we stick around for the health benefits. You just have to experience it to see what we're talking about. Amazing. And Tim, can you tell us a bit about like that value of that window length? Because you could say, hey, just it, uh, lots of people are eating for 18 hours a day today because of the way that the world works. And what really matters is just to shrink that to 12, which is still like 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., right? That's pretty different from you know shrinking it to much shorter periods. To I think that I've heard you, t- Tim, talk a bit about some of those perhaps the microbiome having at least part of the, the answer to that story? Yes. I mean, microbes themselves have a, their own circadian rhythms as well. And they're driven just like humans are by uh, food. So when food arrives, that sort of sets sets them off on, on their particular clocks and things. And we do know that um, your microbiome changes as you're fasting compared to when you're uh, eating. So within the 24 hours, Remember, these these species can you know change and replicate within an hour. Uh, they've had new babies and new lives, etc. Um, and so, what what happens when you're you're fasting is some microbes that uh, don't live off food, but they live off the debris and the uh, lining of the the gut mucosa, suddenly come to life. So when suddenly all that snacking's ended and Jonathan's finished his chocolate. Thank God, we can move on, you know, <laughs> you know, and, and get all those other chocolate-eating uh, microbes out the way, and and the cleaning staff come out, and there's some microbes like Acomancia that's well known because uh, it, 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 it has a name. It says Acomancia municifilia means I love mucus, so it loves the sugary lining of your of your gut. So it's going around tidying up um, your your gut lining that. Um, you you haven't rested properly. And if you don't give it a rest, you don't have enough time for these cleaning microbes really to come out of the woodwork and tidy up your gut and help it regenerate. And it also, what's interesting is that these same microbes that have this job are also seen to be crucial in preventing diabetes and uh, obesity. So Acomancia is one of these microbes that is stimulated when you go on a fast and is now a very trendy uh, novel probiotic for uh, helping your metabolic health and, and help you lose weight. So I think it's, you know, we're just starting to understand which microbes, uh, you know, fit into these categories, but realizing that it, you're getting a whole new team come out uh, if you give them enough time to come out of the woodwork, tidy up your gut, do all the repair work, and really you're in much better shape uh, for the next next time, you know, that chocolate bar comes down. It's a brilliant analogy. So sort of like you've you've put the you've put you've put the trash out uh, overnight and early in the morning. You know, it's it's the clean it's the overnight cleaners in an office that come in and make everything shiny again. You know, it's the offense team in American football versus the defense team. You know, it's like giving them time to to come out so that you've got the right team ready there to deal with uh, your body and what it's and what it needs to do. And if you you put it out of sync by eating the way we weren't intended to by eating over 18 hours it just simply doesn't have enough time to do its job and i think what we're doing in these fasting is really extending the repair side of the body and that's probably the general idea about why fasting is so good and why it has this huge potential in in longevity and so outside of the microbiome do we have the 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 data that that supports that today tim or where are we on that Certainly, there's there's really good data in all these animal models where it's easy to study these sort of things, and there's biomarkers in in humans that suggest the same thing. So I think there's there are these multiple mechanisms going on that are complicated that um, are all pointing the same way that this is really essential for the the body's repair process in the cells and in the gut. It's starting to get noisy outside Jin's window. Can you hear, I can it? hear. So I think the hurricane yes. is really starting to <laughs> to rattle. So uh, I, I was like, I can't believe if they can't hear that. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we heard that for sure, Jin. Yeah. So we appreciate you uh, you hanging in there. Um, we've had a few episodes where people have talked about circadian rhythm, um, Tim, and just sort of how central that is. And that's obviously on this sort of 24-hour cycle and very related to the fact that you know, it used to be dark probably for 12 hours a day. Um, and so I guess probably we weren't doing a great deal of eating. Is that, do you think that's related 
to this um, sort of you know night work, as it were, that you were talking about in the microbiome? Yes, I, I think you know we've evolved to to go in you know uh, twelve hour cycles of light and dark, and and our eating times were meant to be when we're active, and our body needs uh, to process it in those times, and so by us shifting our eating windows outside that, you know, we're, we're not processing the food as well as we should be. And therefore, what we're trying to do with these, certainly this time-restricted eating, is go back to that uh, hunter-gatherer type of uh, time periods for eating, which coincides when our body is best able to deal with it and allows the resting period. So it's that's true. Now, that's quite different to these periods of fasting where actually you're, you're causing a bit of a disruption to the normal circadian clocks it doesn't have the same clues uh, so if you if you are going for a day without food suddenly it's it's shaking up the body a little bit and i think it's it, it's a different uh, concept uh, to the uh, time restricted eating because you your body would expect and it's often switched on once you you know get food and you get light they're the, an exercise they're the things that sort of get your body going and suddenly one of them has stopped your body's going to be um thinking oh what's going on here and this partly uh some of the the feelings that people get through fasting are because this body your body is being reset in a way and and gin might have some views on on why you know that shaking up the body you know might be helpful and so, Jen, does that mean, because we had a lot of questions about this, actually, is the consistency of the timing important? So in other words, I'm going to start eating at midday and I'm going to finish at nine and I do that every day. Is that very important to this being sustainable and easy or can I just do it sometimes? The consistency means that you're doing something every day, right? It, it's consistency of the fact that you maintain a fasting protocol, that doesn't mean it has to be the exact same timing every day. It's just a matter of like, we you know, we don't like, quote, take days off. You know, we're, we don't, you know, have cheat days. But I mean, that doesn't mean though that you can't decide today I'm going out to brunch and I'm going to eat at 10 o'clock. And, you know, what, what worked for me really well was the idea of, you know, keeping my eating window to, you know, like five hours and shifting that around. So if I wanted to shift it to earlier in the day, I could do that, just slide it to a different part of the day. And then, you know, one day my fast was a little shorter because I opened my window earlier, but then I closed it earlier. So the next day my fast, you know, was a little longer because I opened at the time I normally did. So we don't want it to feel regimented and lots and lots of rules that you must follow, but you just want to be consistent enough that your body maintains that metabolic flexibility. You know, if you go on a two week vacation and don't fast at all, you're going to have to come back and you know, get back in the groove again. You know, it has to do with the amount of glycogen stored in your liver and getting through that. And, got it. So you you've know, got some, you're saying it's not, it's not fixed. It's not like I have to do it the same time every day. You're actually relatively flexible, but the duration of the window, I'm sort of keeping constant, even if I change it from day to day. There are plenty of people I know that just, you know, will do this for two or three days a week and they still feel better generally when they do it, but they're not so rigidly fixed on it. And this is one of the things we're going to find out in our massive study because we'll find that some people are only able to do it two or three days a week and others will be doing it all the time. It'll be really interesting to compare them. So you're hoping, Tim, to figure out whether you can get some benefit even if you're doing it some of the time. Exactly, yeah. And can I ask one final question? Because we had a lot of questions around this, which was really about um, female hormones. And I think we both had a lot of questions around if you're in perimenopause or menopause, is this all going to be too stressful for my body? And also people asking, you know, because of changes of hormones during, um, during my cycle um, before menopause, is that going to mean that it only works some of the time? Do you have any sort of anecdotal view on this, Jim? I have very strong feelings about this. And it's just so interesting how, you know, people always start asking this about women. Well, yeah, but isn't it bad for, for women? And you know what is bad for women is over-restriction, you know, being, being overly restrictive with our bodies. And, and when I think back to the way that I used to, you know, quote, diet, you know, throughout my 20s and 30s, the very low-calorie diets I was doing, 
that was actually a lot more restrictive for my body than than the way I eat with intermittent fasting. So we don't want to do intermittent fasting in a way that's overly restrictive for our bodies, whether we're men or women. But women, we definitely do need to be careful about not over restricting and not over exercising. Like I wouldn't do, you know, a one hour eating window and train for an Iron Man and, you know, do all those things at the same time. You have to find what feels good. But our bodies really have great feedback mechanisms in place that let us know what what feels good is usually good for your body. So don't think of intermittent fasting as overly restrictive. It really shouldn't be. And I'm going to tell you that, you know, I started intermittent fasting when I was perimenopausal um, and went through the menopausal transition. I started intermittent fasting in 2014, went through the menopausal transition around 2019-ish. Now I'm on the other side. I'm menopausal, just started hormone replacement therapy. Um, thank goodness it's, that's made a big, a big change already. But I really think intermittent fasting helped me go through intermittent or to go through the menopausal transition with it it wasn't a terrible thing you know and I didn't you know put on a ton of weight like most women do it I really think intermittent fasting was was a great adjunct to making the menopausal transition amazing I have so many more questions but I can see I'm I'm hitting time so I'm going to try and do a quick summary of uh, of of what we covered and and keep me honest if I got it wrong so first I think we explained that intermittent fasting is a lot of things but increasingly it's really focused on this idea of time restricted eating on a regular sort of pattern every day rather than like having full days of of, of fasting. The medical, the clinical evidence is still relatively early in human beings. And then I think we talked, Jin, about this great idea about like, what do you need to do in order to do this? And I think you say you know, 28 days to sort of adjust your body, clean fast. So I'm allowed black tea, I'm allowed black coffee, I'm allowed water, but but no milk, no sweetness. Listen to your body. So if you're shaky or you're nauseous or anything's not working, then then stop think of it as a lifestyle. So this isn't something that you're going to do for a short period of time. This is this is going to be like everything else to do with like lifestyle. It's either something you do always or it doesn't matter, but you don't have to do it every day. I think the final thing we said is that there's this amazing new study, uh, which we hope will be the world's biggest intermittent fasting study. And uh, Jin, I hope you'll be joining it with everybody else. Well, I would love to. Wonderful. Thank you both very much. And Jin, I hope you'll join us when we report back on the results. Fabulous. I can't wait to hear what you found out. And can you believe we made it through I, with no I power wanted to, I was going to say, definitely time to stop before that <laughs> happened. T- Tim, thank you as well. <laughs> we survived. We survived. I did. So far. <laughs> thank you to Jin and Tim for joining me on Zoe Science and Nutrition today. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you want to participate in what we hope will be the world's largest study of intermittent fasting, then go to joinzoe.com slash fasting. And once we have the results from this study, we of course hope to be able to give you personalized advice about whether intermittent fasting is right for you. In the meantime, if you want to understand what to eat when you aren't fasting, then you may want to try Zoe's personalized nutrition program, which will identify the right foods for your body. Each member starts with an at-home test, comparing them with participants in the world's largest nutrition science study. We then use the results to create a program to improve your health and help you manage your weight. If you're interested in learning more about Zoe, you can head to joinzoe.com slash podcast and get 10% off your personalized nutrition program. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. We do love reading your feedback. And if this episode left you with any questions, please send them in on Instagram or Facebook, and we will try to answer them in a future episode. As always, I'm your host, Jonathan Wolfe. Zoe Science and Nutrition is produced by Fascinate Productions with support from Sharon Fedder, Dr. Yella Hewins Martin and Alex Jones here at Zoe. See you next time and hopefully with a fully voice recovered situation. Bye bye.